When I think of the chronic disease burden and how we're going to put a dent in that, reduce the incidence of cardiometabolic disease from type 2 diabetes to cardiovascular disease to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I think right at the center of that is solving this puzzle of how food is affecting appetite, specifically how different foods or combinations of ingredients are increasing appetite, increasing energy intake, and obesity subsequently which I think points to your work being some of the most important work in nutrition science, which I'm hoping becomes evident by the end of today's conversation. You spend a lot of time focusing on palatability and this idea of hyper palatable foods. Maybe we start there. What, what is palatability and what is a hyper palatable food? Yeah, so, so this is a good point to start. Um, palatability is generally used as um, like a subjective term, um, you know, meaning how, you know, how appealing or how pleasant, you know, it is to ingest a specific food. Um, and, and foods should be palatable for us to want to consume them, right? So like a whole... Um, fresh apple or, you know, a raw piece of salmon that'll be cooked, you know, these foods should be palatable, they should be pleasant to consume. The distinction is that um, with hyper palatable foods, they contain combinations of nutrients um, that don't occur together in nature. So nutrients that um, can together kind of exaggerate the flavor profile of a food. So those would be combinations of fat and sodium, f fat and sugar, and carbohydrates and sodium. And so the premise there is that these foods have these combinations of palatability inducing nutrients that occur at like moderate to high thresholds. And the, that is very distinct from foods that are found in nature, which typically just have one single palatability related nutrient. And so together, those food, those um, nutrients, the premise is that they can create an artificially um, kind of exaggerated, um, highly, highly palatable eating occasion, and that it can make them difficult to stop eating. Right. So you, you said food should be palatable. So we need some reward value from, from food so that we can survive, right? Oh, 100%. It keeps us going back to get calories. But what I'm hearing is that when there is a particular combination of ingredients and we might step through those three different combinations uh, throughout this conversation in a little bit more detail but when there is a specific combination of ingredients then you can kind of artificially elevate that reward that that you're getting and so that is increasing appetite beyond what their body actually requires from an energy perspective it has the potential because it creates such a highly rewarding, a, such an intense, um, le pleasurable eating experience. These foods can have, um, can activate in kind of an excessive manner our brain reward neurocircuitry in the same degree as some substances, some other psychoactive substances, and can also delay the engagement of our physiological satiety mechanism. So that can lead to us um, consuming more calories per meal just because it's so good. And, um, you know, that sensation when... Um, when you're eating something and and your your brain is like oh my god like this is so good like i need another bite and your stomach is is like please stop i'm going to explode like that's what i'm getting at right so these foods kind of hit you from two angles mm -hmm. increase the reward mm -hmm. value mm -hmm. and then reduce those satiety inbuilt satiety mechanisms that would ordinarily slow us down Yes, the and I can explain a little bit more about that piece of it. Yeah, yeah. Let's go into what's happening, I guess, in, in the in the brain or the rest of the body that, from a physiological point of view, that is resulting in enhanced reward and then a turning down of those satiety mechanisms. Yeah, absolutely. So, in terms of the enhanced reward, so there is some neuroscience 
science research that was conducted in humans to support the premise that the combination of certain palatability inducing nutrients um, when consumed together um, can have uh, synergistic effects that make the, the um, activation in our brain reward um, neurocircuitry, um, you know, specifically the dopamine um, circuit um, in a, in a high, at a higher and more intense threshold than um, if either of those nutrients would be consumed in isolation. And so what that means is that um, we can end up consuming some foods that, um, you know, can have really powerful effects that are experienced, um, you know, when we're consuming them, but have a very strong kind of uh, neuroscientific basis for them. What's and, the, the like evolutionary explanation for oh, yeah. that? Is it, is it that these combination of ingredients somehow signal to the body that whatever we're eating is, is going to enhance survival? So, so food at its baseline, like, you know, getting back to the, the premise of like food should be palatable. They should be enjoyable to ingest because that promotes our survival. Um, so food consumption does activate our brain reward neurocircuitry. Like that's part of the process of like, us, you know, receiving or, you know, having reinforcement from food because it, you know, increases the likelihood that we'll consume food another time and that promotes our survival. So, so at its basis, like there is activation in our brain reward and our circuitry when we consume whole fresh foods and that promotes our survival. Um, and so the foods that are hyper palatable, um, basically, since they don't occur in nature, our bodies and our brains aren't really prepared to receive and ingest these types of foods. Um, and when we do ingest them, they can activate those same pathways and have some like really exaggerated effects that whole foods don't have and, and they, they shouldn't have, you know, because that and, and so that that's kind of the the tricky point about these foods. And, and there's been a lot of um, research to suggest that, you know, on a single occasion, these can have some sort of, um, you know, excessive activation of this reward um, pathway in the brain. And that's in a single occasion. But with repeated consumption over time, um, many meals over days and weeks and months, um, there's actually some emerging evidence to suggest that these foods can have um, some really substantial effects on our neurobiology in a way that um, that is also similar to what we see with um, regular and um, repetitive consumption of various ty types of substances, including alcohol and nicotine. So for example, the uh, over time, these foods um, can lead to um, changes in the brain that that make us um, highly motivated to seek out and consume these foods. So that means that we become hypersensitive to the cues in the environment that may predict that these foods are going to be available. Hey, friends. The scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today.
That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. So with that repeated exposure, is the reward that we're getting gradually becoming less and less for a given food or dose in that over time through repeated exposure, we actually need more and more of these hyperpalatable foods to get that same sense of satisfaction or relief. Yeah, that that's part of the premise. That's a that's a great question because this sort of gets at something that's been really well established in kind of the basic scientific literature and is now being examined with the lens towards, you know, hyperpalatable foods is this distinction between um, our motivational drive to seek out and consume various foods and then our actual experience when we consume them. So the drive is is um, really kind of what what, you know, well, as it sounds like it, you know, it, it promotes our, our seeking and, and, you know, um, initiating the intake of these foods. But the, um, the kind of, you know, subjective experience of actually consuming them is kind of, is distinct. And so those two in the scientific literature, they're described as wanting, um, which is the, um, the drive, um, and the, and then liking is the subjective response of actually consuming them. And so over time, there is um, evidence to suggest that individuals um, become hypersensitive to um, the cues in the environment that indicate these foods may be available. So that's the wanting. And that's what becomes, uh, we call it sensitization. And is that wanting driven by dopamine? It's part in the pathway, but there are also some changes that occur in, um, in the prefrontal cortex as well that can which the prefrontal cortex is really important for like our self-regulation and things like that so um so some of these ha- um so some of those are connected and so that is kind of part of that process whereas the liking the subjective experience which you were asking about can either may stay the same or it might like people may actually like the food slightly less and so they may be seeking you know more, you know, um, of the same types of foods to try to get that kind of initial effect. Yeah. It'd be interesting, and I'm not sure if anyone's done this, but to scan brain activity during feeding and look at how hyperpalatable foods affect someone who has had a lot of exposure to them through their life versus someone who rarely eats them. Mm-hmm. Yes. And there, there's been some preliminary work done in this area. Um, and um, primarily the most compelling work has been done actually in adolescence. Um, and they have demonstrated that, um, you know, in a few studies looking, uh, you know, kind of cross-sectionally, so a single time point, um, you know, imaging folks um, in a scanner and administering, um, I think it was like a milkshake, which would have like elevated fat and sugar. Um, you know, individuals who had like a lot of prior exposure to and regular consumption of milkshakes or other related things like ice cream and things like that, you know, showed a a greater kind of response and evidence of sensitization compared to individuals who didn't consume it as much. There's also some emerging evidence that kind of looks at that longitudinally when people are experimentally told to like consume this, let's say, you know, sugar sweetened beverage or whatever every single day for like two weeks and we'll, you know. What's the percentage of the typical, say, American adults diet that would be coming from hyper palatable foods? So we know that in the food environment as a whole, almost 70% of the food supply in the United States is hyperpalatable. Um, yeah, our, our latest research found that, you know, like 69% of the food supply as of 2018, which was the, yeah. <laughs> so so we, we, you know, our assumption is that it could be ticking up. Um, and we've done some work to from the 80s up until more recently that has kind of demonstrated an increasing trend of, availability in the food supply over time. So um, that combined with um, looking at studies that have looked at other constructs um, and tell you can tell me if I'm kind of jumping too far ahead or we need to define things as we're going here, but there's no rules. <laughs> um, so let me say that we haven't been able to look at a longitude uh, like a, a study in the US population 
or any population for that matter, that has indicated the um, percentage in the diet. We've looked at just the entire food supply in a whole. Um, but what we can say is that um, a kind of like related-ish constructs, for example, ultra processed foods, which undergo extensive industrial processing and include um, kind of very limited whole ingredients and, um, you know, are kind of highly industrially refined. Um, consumption of those in the diet is like over 60 percent, um, I believe, in in um, U.S. adults. And so, you know, the the premise there is that, you know, there's about 70 percent overlap with foods that are ultra processed and may have these hyper palatable elements that also contain ingredients that can make them you know, excessively palatable. So on the whole, you know, I think we can say that like, you know, 60, 70 percent ish of the food supply and probably the diet. So the majority of someone's diet is likely coming from these hyper palatable foods, which have this artificially enhanced kind of revo reward value, making them very difficult to put down, very easy to overconsume, which ends up kind of manifesting as increased body fat and that, you know, 70% of the adult population in this country, I think, is overweight or obese. Mm -hmm.